Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Wendy Thompson. Welcome to this evening's, good, this morning's, this afternoon's, wherever you are in the world, um, online webinar um, for the International College of Dentistry. Um, I would like to introduce my colleagues, um, Professor Michael McCulloch and Dr. Annie Ruder Agniotri. So let me start off by introducing myself first. Um, I am Dr. Wendy Thompson. I'm a clinical academic general dentist um, at the University of Manchester here in the United Kingdom. Um, and my academic focus is on antibiotic prescribing, resistance and stewardship for people with acute dental problems. Uh, Professor Michael McCulloch is at the University of Melbourne in Australia, and he's a professor of oral medicine, and he's on the expert panel for the therapeutic guidelines for oral and dental. Um, and Dr. Annie Ruda Agniotri is in the States. Um, he's a full-time clinician and a visiting scholar at the University of the Pacific Arthur A. Dugoni School of Dentistry, and he also serves as a director of research at Stevenson Dental Research Institute, San Dimas in California. So welcome, everybody. Um, I need to read you a little bit of a script out now. It says ICD Online is a digital platform for college communications, providing greater outreach and engagement with fellows and the dental community worldwide through live and recorded webinars, videos and other online content. ICD Online offers innovative means for connection, education and research in an increasingly virtual world. This production is brought to you by the ICD Understanding Antimicrobial Resistance Programme. As an attendee, you will have the chance to earn one continuing dental education credit through the Academy of General Dentistry. The Understanding Antimicrobial Resistance Programme aims to disseminate critical information on antibiotic resistance, appropriate use and prescribing to ICD fellows, oral health workers and patients globally to help spread awareness um, and educate. Um, I would like now to introduce you to a video that we're going to show you from the Pew um, uh, Charitable Trust, which is based in Washington, DC in the States. Um, this video is a true story. It's told by the survivor of an antibiotic resistant infection and by his wife. And as you can hear, the um, people having a, a resistant infection doesn't just affect the individual, it affects everyone around them as well. Coming up into, into the city of Portland um, after 11 hours in the saddle got to be emotional. I just broke down. I'm doing this. I'm going to make it. I knew he was going to do it, but I was overcome with a lot of emotion realizing that just six months before that he was lying down on a couch and not able to do the things for himself that he once did. I was part of the good outcome. There are far too many that are on the opposite end and lose their battle, their fight with, it, with their antibiotic resistant infection. My original injury came during a basketball game. Well, he had had surgery on his ACL and uh, Chris actually had already started doing all the recovery process and was walking well. And so we were given permission to go on a trip. And on our way back home from that vacation, we stopped at a water park. Within, I would say, less than 10 hours, his leg was completely swollen, red, hot to touch. I went to the doctor the next day. They were determined that I had uh, acquired a MRSA infection in my knee. The doctor said that we would need to stay in the hospital and be isolated for a few days. They sent us home. His symptoms kind of resurfaced. It felt like the rest of my body was just deteriorating. Go to the emergency room. Put me into panic what mode. What if this doesn't go away? They did several more surgeries on Christopher's knee. Multiple, knees, multiple surgeries. Trying to get the infection under control. There was something going on outside of the surgery that we had not seen. They didn't know where else to look for the infection. Possibly gone to his brain. The doctor basically told me at that point that it had gone to his brain, that there wasn't a lot that they could do because he was on the highest, uh, most potent antibiotic that they know um, to treat MRSA. And I faced the realization that I might lose him. And at 30 years old, I wasn't ready um, to be a widow or to be a single mom. <laughs> They went in and 
uh, removed it all. But with that, Chris lost a lot of movement um, in his leg. He was unable to do the easy things like go to the bathroom by himself or um, get food for himself. I couldn't be the husband that I needed to be, for, that I wanted to be for my wife. I couldn't be who I wanted to be for my kids. When he was really sick, my son would take his Legos and sit on his dad's bed. I love being a dad. More, more than anything, and not being able to be that uh, wrestling, running around, Lego building, tea party, sipping dad that um, I had been. It was incredibly difficult emotionally. It was literally a moment while I was in the hospital in bed that I decided I have to do something. I started looking for a job in healthcare to take the talents and the passion that I have to people who needed it. I think chefs have an amazing power um, to make people happy and to help in the healing process. It's been an incredible journey striving towards this goal of protecting the antibiotics that we have now, whether it's in animal agriculture or human medicine. Every time we use an antibiotic, they become less and less effective. At this point, what I do every quarter is take an inventory of what percentage of the proteins that I'm buying are classified as reduced or responsible use of antibiotics. There are opportunities where antibiotics are the answer. There are places where it's not. So I think we just need to figure out, are we using those tools that we have correctly? Are we making the right decision? Guys, get there. This experience has changed us forever. One, I think learning to seize our moments. Um, we're not promised another breath. I look at where we were and where we are now, and I can't imagine it being the other way. <laughs> I don't want to be part of a post-antibiotic era, and my kids, they're 16 and 14. They got hopefully a very long life ahead of them. I don't want them to go through anything similar to what I did from a simple routine surgery. Wow. Wow, it really brings it into sharp focus, doesn't it? I don't want to be part of a post-antibiotic era either. That's why my research is in this area and it's why I'm absolutely passionate. Um, and I know Professor McCulloch and Dr. Agniotria as well. Um, did you notice the caption which said that two and a half million people suffer from a resistant infection every year in the States? Did you notice, or did you know, sorry, that a million people die every year globally from an antibiotic resistant infection. In 2019, that million people was more people than die from HIV and malaria combined. This isn't an issue for the future. This is an issue in the here and now. It's something that we all have a role in tackling. Um, and it was something that has a major impact on Chris and his whole family, uh, on his health and well-being a life-changing impact and something that we can all we can all have an effect on so what's this got to do with dentistry what's it got to do with you and me why why are we all part of this webinar um so michael it's okay isn't it to give antibiotics when patients want them um no <laughs> um it's funny when you when you look at um how much prescribing dentists do in australia it's around about 10 percent um, 10 percent of all antibiotic prescriptions are written by dentists and we did a study a, a couple of years ago looking at is that appropriate but we've got and I think across the world there's very good therapeutic guidelines um, that are in different in all of our different areas um, and the um, when we went and compared the prescribing that that dentists do in Australia around about 40 45 percent of it is incorrect against those guidelines and we, we then went and asked um, dentists, we did a survey around about a oh, thousand odd dentists and they told us in this survey of what they did and what they didn't do. It really got um, quite interesting when we end, we end up doing one-on-one -on -one interviews with people. Um, and we're actually talking to the dentist and and, and, and individual dentists at a time um, saying, you know, why, why, when do you prescribe inappropriately and when do you not prescribe? Um, the, um, 
and I've got some of the responses, but one that stands out particularly is this guy saying that, you know, actually I, I, the, the, the patients walk in with demanding the antibiotic and it's because the reception has told them you know, two hours beforehand, you know, the, the patient comes in at one o'clock, one thirty, in pain. And the receptionist says, look, there's only a 15 minute appointment in a couple of hours if you want to come back. But the only thing you're going to get then is an antibiotic. So the patient comes in and sees the dentist, look, sorry, doctor, I know you're really busy, but um, I'm just here for the antibiotic. If you write the prescription, I'll go without even looking in their mouths. And it was sort of, it brought up this thing of, you know, you've got to, we've got to do the dentistry not the drugs. Um, we got to get the diagnosis right. Us getting the diagnosis, not not, not the receptionist diagnosing things. Um, get the dentistry, get the diagnosis right, do the dentistry. And most of the time, we don't need the drugs. Um, we don't need to prescribe antibiotics at all. That's the beauty yeah, of doing absolutely. dentistry is we can fix things. Absolutely. It's, we're dental surgeons, aren't we? We're, we're equipped yeah. and skilled to diagnose and to treat. Um, that's something that I, I recognize very much from my from my research um, and also from my clinical practice. Annie, you were telling us earlier about a story very recently where where um, where a patient was was given exactly that message by reception. Yes. Uh, so I had. Uh, when I joined uh, where I work uh, in a community clinic, the patients do come uh, asking for a quick fix and uh, we have a very busy practice. So. Was an experienced uh, uh, front uh, front desk or receptionist. She used to let the patients know uh, that they will get what they uh, are asking for. And patients used to well, patients used to uh, talk to me and try to solicit an antibiotics, which was quite common, as Mike said. And I think it's it's uh, it's very hard to communicate with those patients because they come with an idea. Uh, and uh, they they think that uh, they will get what they they know what they need, and uh, you, sometimes it gets hard to communicate with them, and it actually takes longer to speak with them. You know, I had a similar kind of case yesterday. A patient uh, walked in with, uh, and they had ir symptomatic irreversible pulpitis, uh, and uh, they're a nurse uh, student, nursing student. A daughter of a nurse practitioner, and they had uh, clindamycin from some other prescription, which they started taking uh, 150 grams four times a day uh, because it was the prescription for whatever they got it. I, I don't know the condition. And uh, the nurse practitioner actually diagnosed her of uh, uh, cellulitis or an abscess. and. I had to explain her everything and talk about inflammation. Um, symptomatic reversible pulpitis is uh, almost 67 to 70% of uh, dental pain. It's excruciating. Uh, a lot of changes in the nerve. The inflammation causes allodynia, something similar to sunburn. And there's a, the tooth yeah. is hard to numb. And uh, that's why people dentists and uh, patients, they, they just want to get out of pain and they think it's an infection and antibiotics will relieve them of pain. So, so this is similar in some ways, um, uh, antibiotics not working for inflammation in the same way that they don't work for viral infections. So when we hear about GPs and doctors refer, uh, giving antibiotics for a respiratory tract infection, which is viral, it's the same message really, I guess. Uh, antibiotics don't work for a virus, they don't work for an inflammation. The, the difficulty is people, I guess, are trying to self-diagnose and just don't realise that there are lots of Lots of diagnoses for, for toothache um, and without doing the tests, how do we know? Yeah. Um, so, so we've talked there about therapeutic antibiotic prescribing. Um, I wonder about prophylaxis. I, I know that there are different guidelines around the world for prophylactic prescribing to, to prevent local site infections and distant site infections. So here in the UK, um, you probably know that we have guidelines which are a, a bit different. I know that there are some other countries in Scandinavia maybe also following the same same pattern of um, we don't routinely give antibiotics as prophylaxis for people at risk of infective endocarditis, for example. Um, how, how is it in, in um, Australia and America for you guys? Mike. Annie Ruder, do you want to go answer that? 
So uh, the guidelines have been changing uh, a lot. And uh, for the last 10 to 15 years, they've stayed pretty much the same. Um, it's usually six months. Uh, if, if they had, they are high risk and they had a procedure in the last six months that uh, we prescribe um, antimicrobials as a, for prophylactic uses, uh, purpose. Uh, but the translation of that into practice is, is not uh, very good. Uh, because there was a lot of confusion around it, as the old guidelines are still, uh, people who actually graduated with the old guidelines are still in practice, and um, it's hard to believe. And some of my patients have also, uh, you know, they, they do mention that, oh, but I have always taken these uh, antibiotics. So I start talking to them how the guidelines have changed since the 60s. Uh, when they used to give it for two be two weeks, uh, and then slowly they reduced it, and they have realized that they they went on more aggressive antibiotics and having more uh, antimicrobial resistance uh, in the environment, and uh, the the numbers have not changed, so the guidelines are changing, and I think uh, uh, they they will probably follow what exactly UK does soon. Um, and yeah, that's that's what- We're heading what in that direction, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. It's interesting you talk about the 1960s because you think back to when Fleming had his accident with his bread mold on his Petri dishes here in, here, here in the UK. Um, and that was in the 1920s, so not even 100 years ago yet. Um, and it was only really during the Second World War that, um, that penicillin started being used. Um, so that was in the 1940s. I think it was 1945 he got his Nobel Prize for, for, um, for penicillin. Um, and you're talking about the 1960s there. So that's just 20 years later, really. Antibiotics had all of the benefits and not really any of the risks at the time. You know, I did my microbiology degree in, in the early 1990s. Again, it was antibiotics still had lots of the benefits and not really. We knew about resistance, but it wasn't wasn't really a major problem. We were all more interested in the viral infections, HIV, sorting out um, some. You know, it was a death sentence at the time, so sorting out um, viral things and some of the fabulous advances that they have now. Now is the time we need to be looking at these uh, resistant infections again. But but Michael, tell, tell me, is it just um, just antibiotic resistance that we need to worry about? Or are there any other adverse um, outcomes, um, maybe associated with prophylactic prescribing in particular, that we need to be worried about? Yeah, and that, well, that thing that Annie Rudy uh, was talking about, um, about how the guidelines have changed and in, in the last 10 years sort of highlights and the fact that dentists don't actually always follow guidelines because they graduated beforehand. And, you know, we don't need to keep up to date with anything, do we? We'll just do what we did when we graduated. Or more importantly, the first person we worked for, um, whatever they did and whatever they prescribed, we'll just keep doing that because they were the ones who paid us our wage so it's and our, th our therapeutic guidelines in Australia are very much like America um, uh, with antibiotic prophylaxis um, there's a little bit difference with Indigenous Australians uh, particularly in lower socioeconomic areas um, there's uh, very very high rates of infective endocarditis in the top end of Australia in Indigenous um, so the the infective um, the specialists um, infectious disease specialists were saying that you know in those areas we still need to have good antibiotic prophylaxis in, in so but it's very small um the thing is that it, the therapeutic guidelines just because you've got guidelines it's not like you know the pirates code is it you know they, they'd be just guidelines you don't actually have to follow them um until something goes drastically wrong um and then the you know courts of law or, or coroners will turn around and say well what are the guidelines what, what are the um what, what are, I think we need more than just guidelines though we need good education to our oral health practitioners um and and the message is getting out to to the to the general public about um, antimicrobial susceptibility we need to ride on that to make sure that our patients also also know know what they should and shouldn't be doing and that story you told about the patient yesterday, Annie Ruta, not following um, the, um, that not following, you know, just taking prescript, taking the medication, even though it, it's kind of, it's common, you know, it's that people are doing it. 
the, 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 there's a bit of concern about prosthetic hips um, and infections with um, it, the potential of getting infections with prosthetic hips because when we when we pre produced the first set of therapeutic guidelines about 2006 7 in Australia um there was a there was a lot of pushback from dentists back then sort of saying oh but the orthopedic surgeon says the dentist you know every time you go and see a dentist for the rest of your life you have to keep on taking these antibiotics um every single time so there's a lot of pressure put on dentists to continue even though our guidelines are changed to initially three months and then in the second um our second therapeutic guidelines which was 2012 it was none at all you, you don't need um antibiotic prophylaxis for somebody who's had a um a prosthetic hip replacement and still the orthopedic surgeons were saying oh you know yeah yeah you yeah, have to do it because you yeah, know I'm the surgeon you keep on telling we 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 in Australia we did a funny thing we pushed back to them by saying give in our Australian Dental Association news bulletin writing a letter saying if you do have a, an orthopedic surgeon who's like this don't write the prescription write them a letter and say you can prescribe the antibiotics for the patient because it's the person who writes the prescription has to take responsibility for that prescription and if you're a dentist writing the prescription it's like and you know that it's wrong and you know you shouldn't be you shouldn't be prescribing something um you're still the person who takes responsibility if the if the orthopedic surgeon wants somebody to have antibiotics every time they go and visit a dental practice and if you think about that you know you're visiting the dental practice with taking your child to get their orthodontics sorted but you keep on taking the antibiotic prophylaxis just in case because you're visiting the dentist you know, every time you visit the dentist to pay a bill, every time you visit the dentist for, you know, getting a radiograph or a simple checkup, you take antibiotic prophylaxis because the orthopedic surgeon says so. I like to, I tell a story with the Australian dentist, let's call the, the orthopedic surgeon Fred and then end up calling him Dr. Flintstone. Um, and we're not Barney Rubble. We we shouldn't be just doing, oh, no, but he's a big guy, you know, and he's got a big stick. So we're frightened of this orthopedic surgeon. We've got to do the right thing by our patients and push back. Now, that that hasn't, uh, so the last maybe five or six years, the um, orthopedic, the, the, the peak body in Australia, the Australian Orthopedic Academy or Association, are kind of fully on board now. And we don't... Um, we don't, I don't hear of that problem anymore much in Australia because the orthopedic surgeons have, in a, in a fashion, we dentists have kind of educated them about antimicrobial stewardship, which is great. It's good. Mm, I think that's going on in the States as well, isn't it? They've, they've um, been publishing some stuff just recently um, showing that prosthetic joint infections really don't need that. In fact, I think it was a, a study comparing UK and US data, which showed that we really don't need to be using prophylaxis. Yes, uh, they, the Orthopedic Society here worked with the ADA to come up with a joint position paper, and uh, that is uh, really helpful because uh, both the uh, healthcare providers are on board. Uh, so it's it's changing. I do agree with that. But, but you know, this is this is all about the patients, isn't it? Um, uh, you can imagine having. I I've, I've had a patient myself who came in. She had a chronic abscess on a tooth um, and she said that my orthopedic surgeon says that you have to give me prophylaxis before anything which might possibly cause a bacteremia. Oh, and by the way, it's got to be IV flucloxacillin. And I just fell about laughing and I said, even if I could give you prophylaxis or even if it was indicated, I can't give you flucloxacillin because it's not within our, our formulary in the UK um, and for dentists. And even if I could give you flucloxacillin, I can't give you IV. Um, and actually what you need to have is that that chronic infection on that tooth sorted out rather than, you know, me me giving you an antibiotic every time I scale you. And she said, oh, no, you're not you're not sorting out. And I said, I will give you an antibiotic before I sort out that chronic infection, because because there's a chronic infection there and, and you're worried. Um, but she said, oh, no, you're not, you're not taking that tooth out. Uh, and mm. you can see it from the patient's perspective. They trust the orthopedic surgeon. They've got lots of letters after their name. They've, they've trusted them to put them under general anesthetic, to cut the body in two, to take out half of the hip and put in another half of the hip. Or you've got Wendy sitting there in the Yorkshire Dales in a very remote and rural part of the UK saying, no, I'm not giving you a prescription because I don't think you need it. My, my guideline, my dental guideline. And she says, you're here to make my teeth look pretty Wendy I trust him to look after my health and so it's um it's a very difficult situation I may be right 
but that's not necessarily the patient's perception and and what makes them feel comfortable and and i was struck by something that you both said earlier um, and it, it it was about patient expectations and if a patient comes in expecting one thing and they get something else then then that's not a great place to be in terms of patient satisfaction and when you're in the kind of business that we are in as dentists um certainly when you're in general dental practice and, and you're about um needing repeat business to to maintain the business flow and keeping patients satisfied um then then managing patient expectations and having your receptionists playing from the same tune as mm. as you are going to be is really really important really important so i remember hearing um when i worked in one practice they'd say i will book you in for five five minutes at five to five on friday because it's only going to be an antibiotic you're going to get and then i'd be saying to my nurse right well actually what i need to get is that sharp pointy needle and i need to get those forceps for taking this tooth out and she's looking at me saying oh for goodness sakes wendy we're going to have to put this lot through the decon and wash it all up before we go home and i'm going out tonight and you've got the patient thinking <laughs> well I don't really like needles very much and certainly don't want my tooth taking out at this time on a Friday because I've got a weekend of, you know, going out and having fun as well. No one's in a good place. I went to a new practice, a different practice to work. Um, and I used to hear the receptionist saying, look, yeah, I know you only want five minutes for an antibiotic, but do you know what? You and I don't know what Wendy's going to find when she looks in your mouth. So why don't I book you in for 20 minutes at quarter to 10 in the morning? Um, and then if it is only five minutes for an antibiotic, she won't mind. She'll go and get a cup of tea or she'll, um, you know, she'll write her, do her referrals or whatever it is that she's got to do. Um, but it, it gives us enough time if we, if antibiotics aren't really the right answer and what we need to do is something else to get you out of pain. Because because it's getting you out of pain that you really want the quick fix on, isn't it? It isn't just getting a prescription. It just yeah. changes that um uh, the dialogue great. and and you're right about the you know the orthopedic surgeon has just changed this person's life you know by by getting them a new hip so of course they, they're going to going to want to do that there's also um a kind of a similar discussion happening with um, osteonecrosis of the jaw related to medication use um you know uh, it should firstly should you um take a tooth out on somebody who's who's been on a bisphosphonate or donozumab um, and and when you should do that there's a whole lot of discussion about that but then there's the antibiotic prophylaxis or should we be giving it or not giving antibiotic prophylaxis and uh, um, there's a lot of confusion around that I think as well uh, um, across Australia in different parts of Australia there's there's areas which are strongly recommending not just antibiotic prophylaxis but two weeks worth of antibiotic pro antibiotics prior to taking a tooth out to de decrease the likelihood of getting mronge, which is not an infection. It's just a it's a non healing thing. It's not it's not a, it's not a, so there's there's a lot of strange things and there. It's almost worse than that, Michael, because because mronge is a, a dead tissue, so there's no blood supply to it. So how on earth the antibiotic getting there in the first place? Yeah, even if it yeah. was going to do anything to sort out an infection. So yeah, we've we've had those discussions in the UK as well, and and the guidelines here are very clearly no prophylaxis. It, it's interesting, isn't it, when you talk about prophylaxis, implants as well. You hear some people saying that when they're putting a dental implant in, they should have two weeks of prophylaxis um, before, during, and after the implant procedure. And yet, any surgical prophylaxis, it doesn't matter whether it's a dental dental surgery or or you know medical surgeries prophylaxis is just one dose within one hour of the surgery starting yep. uh, after that yep. it has no impact at all on the outcome um, and yet we're putting patients at risk of of the adverse outcomes uh, and the longer you take antibiotics for the more risk there is of you getting these these adverse outcomes so i'm thinking of not just the resistance but i'm thinking of of the um, allergies and, and of the c diff as well have either of you had experience or want to talk about those sorts of adverse outcomes? So I had a patient <clears throat> whose family member had C. diff and um, they just wanted the treatment and uh, they were very adamant about not having antibiotics. Uh, and they also just had uh, irreversible pulpitis. So they were uh, kind of pushy and they came to me so, so how it happens is that we have multiple providers and uh, she was seen by somebody else at another site and uh, she told me that she did not take it. 
and uh, she wanted she just came back uh, in a couple of days asking if you know there could be a place where she could get the treatment sooner because she did get a referral and, so she uh, wanted a procedure not a prescription that's a great message isn't it yeah. i've i've had a patient who wanted that as well actually yeah uh, they're telling us to do the dentistry that's good message is starting to get through when we hear that but that was that was an unfortunate situation wasn't it where a family member had to be sick with clostridium difficile or clostridioides difficile as it's called these days uh, do either of you want to talk a little bit more about what that is for for those for people on the uh, webinar who may not have heard of it before i thought you could you're the microbiologist i i can talk about c diff if you wish yeah yeah, yeah. Go ahead. so um we have to so c diff is um, a very very severe diarrheal disease it has a death rate associated with it it's particularly associated with clindamycin um, and uh, other broad spectrum antibiotics like coamoxiclav but it can be any antibiotic it can be um amoxicillin it can be even erythromycin or the um, macrolides and if you take an antibiotic into your mouth here it will go all the way through your system and about 80% of it comes out the other end completely unaltered. So it, it's actually affecting the resistance in the environment as well. So when you take an antibiotic, it isn't just the, the individual that you're affecting, it's, um, it's the environment. But also it's everything that goes, it, the antibiotic doesn't go, oh, you've got a toothache, I'll go and sort out the abscess. It actually affects all of the microbiome, all of the bacteria that live on and, and, and within us. Um, and as you all know, um, humans aren't just made up of human cells. We're made up of bacterial cells as well because we can't digest food. You know, we need the, the microbiome within our gut, the bacteria and the viruses and the fungi in there to digest some of the food before we can um, before we can use its energy. Um, and if you take an antibiotic, a broad spectrum, and it clears out everything within your gut that's susceptible to it, then the things that are left are the things that don't respond to it. Now, that might be a resistant bacterium, but in your gut, it's more likely to be an anaerobic bacterium that doesn't respond to it. Um, and Clostridioides difficile or Clostridium difficile, as it used to be known, is one of those. And, and I keep talking about Clostridium difficile because it's in the same family. It's like a cousin, if you like, of Clostridium tetani. Um, and Clostridium botulinum. And Clostridium botulinum, as dentists, we kind of know quite a lot because it's where Botox comes from. And um, Botox is um, a toxin that's been, um, that the Clostridium botulinum bacteria will make if they're growing in an anaerobic environment. And if you purify that toxin, Dentists then inject it into people's faces to make them look surprised, you know, paralyzes their muscles. And um, we kind of we kind of know it as being that, but actually, if you have um, Clostridium difficile or Clostridioides difficile within your gut, it makes three different kinds of toxins, and they paralyze your gut and they do different things to give you toxic megacolon or uh, antibiotic related colitis. They're all different names for for this really nasty diarrheal disease that you get. And as I say, people do die from it. So we need to be really careful about giving any antibiotic at all, because we don't know who's got these Clostridioides difficile bacteria within them already. Some, some people will do, some people won't do. Um, and I'm particularly passionate, if you like, about the antibiotic agenda, because about 20 years ago, my aunt was in hospital um, and she actually picked up C. diff while she was in hospital and she passed away from it, aged 60. And it um, made me realize I'd done a microbiology degree. It was before I was a, actually before I was a dentist. Um, but I'd never heard of anyone having C. diff and I'd never heard of anyone dying from C. diff. And so it makes it, it's another of these patient stories, isn't it? That really brings it mm. home to you. So, so yeah. Particularly a young is, auntie, 60s, 60s young, you know, Wendy, that's I extremely know. young. I know, I know, I'm getting closer mm. to it myself. It's really scary. Yes. <laughs> Um, the, um, so, so, yeah. so it does occur more commonly with people when taking clindamycin, though, than penicillin. Yeah, it, it very definitely does seem to. And in, in fact, in the States, they changed their guidelines recently. So it used to be, Annie can probably tell us more about this. It used to be your second choice drug, didn't it, Annie, when people were allergic to penicillin? Yes. Yeah, so and for the dental, it's still the same. Uh, they haven't really changed it yet, but. Uh, I would like to hear from you what 
Yeah, I think they changed mm. um, the drug away from clindamycin towards um, mac no to cephalosporin for the um, mm. for penicillin allergic patients where uh, where possible. Because it used to be thought that there was a cross reactivity between penis. If you were allergic to penicillin, you were also allergic to cephalosporins, and I think, I think they've disproven that. Um, and so, yeah. Mm. Maybe that, um, that, yeah. I was going to say that whole thing about um, penicillin allergy. Uh, there's a bit of a, well, we'd say furphy in Australia. That's probably not an international audience. Have any idea what a furphy is? Um, a lot of the times, it's 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 untrue. Uh, it comes from the First World War and uh, a, a water thing that um, people stand around and tell tall stories about. Um, the um, it, so it's probably in a lot of patients it's untrue. In fact, it, we, there's evidence to show that only about ten percent of people who say they're allergic to penicillin are actually allergic to penicillin, um, and they'd be much better off um, using a narrower spectrum um, antibiotic like penicillin rather than getting any of the other ones, the clindamycin or, or anything else, um, because there is a decreased chance of getting C diff. Um, at diff. So we've started a study trying to delabel people and it sounds really weird that you're delabeling somebody but getting them to realize that they're not actually allergic to penicillin that um and when we started this study it's only about two or three weeks ago and to actually do it you have to be able to give somebody an antibiotic that they may have an anaphylactic reaction to in a very controlled environment so we're doing it with an anesthetist and and it's in a controlled environment that they're doing it and some of the stories that are coming out are quite there was one guy who's part of this study. He turned up and said, "Oh no, no, I've got, I've got a penicillin allergy because my mum had one. So um, she, she, when she was young, she got a little bit sick when she was taking antibiotics, uh, a penicillin. So I'm not allowed to have one. She's told me that since I was sort of four or five years old. And this person's like in their thirties. Think, no, probably not, mate. Let's, you know, so." Trying to delabel somebody that that a penicillin um, that they don't have a penicillin allergy is also a good thing because they when they do need an antibiotic it's a narrower spectrum and it's a bit safer less likely to get C diff as well so sure. hopefully we'll see what happens with the study. I think Should I've work. had the same patient as you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I've definitely heard that from at least one person. Yeah. Um, so I'd so we've talked there about we've talked about indications for antibiotics and we've talked about types of antibiotics um, and we've talked as well about patients wanting antibiotics but but i know that annie has a, a great story to tell us um, and this isn't just about uh, antibiotics but it's about it's about treating that the whole patient isn't it and it goes back to michael's do the dentistry not the drugs um, and doing the drugs isn't just doing antibiotics. It's very often people want the antibiotics because they don't want the procedure. Um, they want, uh, certainly in the UK, 12% of the population is dental phobic. So um, they want to be knocked out before having a dental procedure. They want to not remember it. It's, it there are some very severe reactions people have, um, emotional type reactions to um, antibiotics. Um, and, and Annie's got a great story about how by being able to provide that continuity of care and um, care in its broader sense, so people feeling cared for, not just not just having dental care. Annie, uh, do you want to tell us what uh, your story about this patient? Sure, so this is about the anxiety and uh, soliciting antibiotics. So there's there was this patient, he came to the dental clinic, uh, uh, to two to three providers got uh, referrals and his blood pressure was always very high and uh, he was a smoker. Uh, so he got the antibiotics and he used to leave, but then uh, uh, he saw me and I sent him to the medical side to get taken care of his blood pressure uh, so that I can treat him because he was not going to the, the referred uh, uh, oral surgeon for almost eight to nine months. Uh, and I explained him how important it is. And uh, the medical doctors tried to lower his blood pressure, but when he came to his dental visit, it was always high. So we had a psychologist on board. I uh, introduced him to her and she discovered he had dental anxiety. So gave him very little uh, sedation just to 
oral sedation just before his dental uh, procedure. And uh, he brought his uh, sister with him and he did not like the dental treatment at all. Uh, and uh, he needed extractions on both the side. He had uh, grossly decayed teeth with uh, local abscesses. Uh, it was a very, very, very bad situation and he needed more treatment. So I told him to come back for an exam and uh, get taken care of. But, you know, he did not come back. He was not very happy getting the dental treatment. And recently, after a year, he returned and he told me that he was having the same uh, pain on the other side where I advised him to get extraction. And he said because of his last experience, he thought that it would be best to just get the tooth taken out. And uh, so we scheduled him with his uh, pre-medication and then uh, got the tooth out and I haven't seen him since. Uh, but still, I'm, I'm pretty impressed by the way, you know, he, uh, we all kind of worked together on this because he had a medical side who was trying to work on his blood pressure. And then we discovered about his dental anxiety and uh, the psychologist helped, the medical doctors helped and uh, we treated him. And he also understood what he needs. Uh, and it's, it's not always right to just want antibiotics when you can actually uh, get the treatment done and then have a better quality of life. It's great, isn't it? When you, when you get a patient who sees the light and, and realizes that we have their best interests at heart and that you know the, the procedure really is the quickest fix for them. Um, I have a, a story from a patient who was visiting our area um, who was in pain. We didn't realize that she was due to go for a skydive to celebrate her 30th birthday. But by giving her a procedure for the um, apical periodontitis that she had rather than a prescription, she'd assumed she'd had antibiotics in the past for this toothache and she'd assumed that the antibiotics were going to be what was given and she wasn't convinced it was going to work very quickly if at all, but that she needed to come and do something because she was in agony. Um, and I said I was going to do a procedure which she was very nervous about. But when she, when we came back after the bank holiday weekend, we had an email, a lovely email from her, from showing us her skydiving um, and how having had the procedure the very next day, she was right enough and well enough to be able to go out and enjoy herself. And, and it made a real difference to that person's life. And um, and it, just seeing the photograph of her skydiving with a massive smile on her face just made it made it all OK. And it's that feel good factor, isn't it? It's uh, as Annie's describing there as well. It's um, knowing that you've done the right thing for the patient. And as Michael said, knowing that the, doing the dentistry, doing the dental surgery, which is what we're trained to do and not just not just doing biro dentistry, prescribing a drug it, it is really great. Um, now not I'm not sure about that whole thing about jumping out of planes. My son did that a while ago. And yeah, <clears throat> is that a way of celebrating turning 30? That sounds Apparently really so. Silly. Yeah, she didn't tell us this before uh, when she arrived for the appointment. Um, mm. Okay, we've got some questions online, um, which is great. Um, the first one is about joint replacement um, and someone in the States who is worried um, that the changing guidelines, I think they're still not entirely convinced about the changing guidelines if I'm reading between the lines. It says, I get worried within the first six months after the replacement, are there any precautions within this time period? Uh, in, the, in the UK, the answer is no. Um, I don't know about what your guidelines in the States are, Annie. So in these States, it's uh, the guidelines are still six months, that the first six months we have to uh, give the prophylactic antibiotics. There have been some uh, they have not changed it yet, but they're in that direction and uh, they have reduced it to people who have systemic, uh, who have uh, uh, low immunity that would get the uh, prophylactic antibiotics and it's slowly changing. So it's, it's not out there yet. The, those, the guidelines, that joint paper that I was talking about did, does say about six months and it's uh, there have been some follow-up of those same authors in, in, in uh, different uh, aspects. And we have not yet seen the change, but for, for the US, that's the, the current guideline. So that's correct. 
Okay. How, how about you, Michael? What would it be in Australia? Oh, no, we're, we're down to zero as well. Um, there, there's no time afterwards. It went to, well, there was a stage when it went to three months um, and then it went to zero. But during that, you, know, you, can, you can understand the anxiety of, a, of somebody who's had a hip replacement and, you know, we, which we talked about coming from the patient, but also from the dentist, you know, can we, can we, should we, you know, be, be looking after our patients and that. And I, I turned to them and said, you know, what, do you have to take the tooth out? Do you have to do that invasive procedure within three months or six months of having a hip replacement? Is there something we can do to get this patient out of pain um, that will not get them to have a, 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 a a bacteremia at all um, and there's lots of things we can do in dentistry like that put temporary fillings in open and drain um you know so that we can and and put a um something within the pulp to decrease this but just wait just wait for a while leave the tooth there don't rush in to take it out and which which person's just had a the hip replaced is rushing off to see the dentist for a yeah, yes, if they're in pain, then they need something done. But does it always have to be? Now, there are some situations where you do, you know, if someone's got really bad periodontal abscess, uh, periapical abscess, but, you know, you've got to actually do the dentistry, um, yeah. but you know, take the tooth out. But there's there's often ways that you can delay things. And that that thing with medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaw is, is similar if patients on, there's a thing in Australia, and I think the United States as well, that they're, we're delaying treatment to until just before the next six monthly infusion of donozumab, that will decrease the likelihood of um, of uh, of having um, having increase decrease the likelihood of getting ronch. Um, I don't know whether there's really good evidence for that. It sounds good, um, but I don't know whether there's actually any publications that have come out and said that there actually is a decrease in in um, Ronj incidence um, if it's if the extraction happens like in the last three weeks before the next six monthly injection. Yeah, you see, the UK guidelines would say that there's no difference because the yep. half life of denosumab is like twenty years or something, isn't it? So once you've taken bisphosphonate, it, it is. Denosumab, uh, it is. Sorry, you're Denosumab, right. yeah. Yeah, um, denosumab, it is bisphosphonates, yeah, definitely, it lasts forever. Um, you know, those and MAB drugs, are, they make me so proud, those MAB drugs, because when I was doing my microbiology degree, I worked in the labs, in the research labs for a year as like a sandwich year in industry. Mm -hmm. And the, yeah. the monoclonal antibody drugs, any drug that ends in MAB is a monoclonal antibody, like a magic yeah. bullet. They were a theory on a piece of paper at the time. So to actually yeah. see them out there and in, in use for patients makes me like really like a proud mum. <laughs> it's a... Uh, uh, yeah, no, it is. It is good, but the, the similar thing hasn't really happened with antibiotics. You know that that we don't have a bunch of new antibiotics that are coming out at anywhere near the rate of um, of the monoclonal antibodies and some of the new cancer yeah. therapies that they're out. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, I was asking, maybe delayed. asking someone the other day whether they could use the same kind of technology for like the monoclonal antibodies, whether they could like stick an a, a antibi antibiotic onto the end of a, a monoclonal antibody and then zap it in like a magic bullet. And they were saying it's been tried and it doesn't really, it's a bit too, um, you can be a bit too clever, a bit too accurate with these mm. things. Antibiotics work by being not quite as accurate as, as um, yeah. maybe some cancer drugs need to be. Um, let's see what else we have here. Um, how do we get the health? Um, this is a, a United States question again. How do we get the health brackets, medical and dental community onto the same page in regards to antibiotic prophylaxis? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's hard, really isn't question. it? Um, <laughs> and obviously with having such um, quite stark guideline change in the UK 15 years ago, whenever it was, we had we had quite a, a handbrake turn, if you like, um, you know, that we had to change direction. And the, the dentists, because we were the ones doing the prescribing, were the ones that were told, you will not prescribe. You will get into trouble if you prescribe. And the medics were still saying to the patients, oh, but you need to have someone prescribing for you. And, and it's exactly the point, Michael, you were making about, well, you say to the medics, well, you prescribe it then. You know, I can't prescribe it, but but you can. And it's the, the patient stuck in the middle who ends up uh, with the problem. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, how do you change that? It's you know, the, the people who um, are asking us to um, give prophylaxis. So, you know, the, the orthopedic surgeons or the cardiac consultants, they're the ones who see the problems. If someone gets a prosthetic joint infection or a, 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 an infective endocarditis, 
we don't see that. We see the problem and the infectious diseases consultants see the problem if someone has a resistant infection or a C. diff infection. Um, and the allergists are the ones who see a problem if someone has a, an allergy infection. And, and we see the problem if they come back with the toothache again. And so it, you need to have that um, follow up, if you like, um, and different perspectives. And it's almost like we need a multidisciplinary clinic where we can all see the overall outcome for these patients. Um, yeah, it needs to have repercussions for everybody in the same way. Uh, yeah, and it's and it's complex because our health systems are, are different. Um, the the UK health system is very different from from most other places around the world. Um, the um, and ours is um, much more like uh, the United States, where there's a lot more private um, uh, dentistry and and private um, health provision. Um, but but there are ways of doing that through our representative bodies um, and coming up with these guidelines and keep on talking about what is best practice and have the patient at the at the center there all the time but it's just not a quick fix um, and it's not just one thing like it's an education for the patients for the different health professionals for all of our for our little guilds that do different things that we're that we're good at we all need to get sort of on the same page um, and and this whole this antimicrobial stewardship is happening across the world, um, you know. So it is it is a very topical thing, and it is changing. I think it's a little bit like you know, in some ways, a bit like climate change. Um, that there's now not that many people who are antimicrobial resistant deniers. Um, that there's we, we understand that this is a problem, and we've just got to get on the same page and and work through all the all of the complexity of it, if you like. Yeah, it's interesting you say yeah. that, Michael, and. Um... So sometimes when I'm lecturing, I talk about um, how the similarities between antibiotic resistance and, and climate change, because it's all part of the sustainable sustainability agenda. You know, the, the United Nations and the World Health Organization talk about sustainability being making sure that um, future generations have the same access to um, resources that we have today to to keep them safe and to um, so. Um, being able to use fuel resources or being able to use antibiotics in the future in the same way that we can use them today is, is a massive part of the sustainability agenda. And it's, um, it's I think, difficult. I think it was, was you actually, Wendy, I listened to one of your lectures when oh. you were giving that. Um, well, that was the was FDI listening. one last year. And I thought, yeah, Gee, that's a really good analogy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and they, they say that within 30 years, more people will die from um, a, antimicrobial resistant infection than died than will die from cancer within 30 years mm. and you think back 30 years and, and you kind of realize that that's 1992 um, and what were you doing in 1992 and that's for those of us who are old and bold that's, that's when I was doing my microbiology degree you know 1992 was um, I, I wrote an editorial recently for the British Dental Journal and I called it don't let the sun go down on antibiotics because 1992 is when Elton John and um, oh uh, George Michael were singing Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me. And you think, no, that mm. can't be 30 years ago. But that's 30 years ago. And yeah. it's, um, it, it's incredible yeah, things to think change. another 30 years. Another 30 yeah. years and when look, people will die from resistant infections when, and cancer. When you were talking about 1992, I was in the middle of the PhD and I was seeing HIV patients and looking at Canada in oral yeast in HIV patients. And I enrolled about 220 odd people in the study. And there's only two of them that are, that lived um, you know, in 92. By the time we got to 95, they're all because it yes. was in the pre-heart era. And you think, well, now it, you know, people, it, it's, it's become a chronic medical condition, but people are living quite well long Isn't lives with um, with hiv changed. infection yeah, yeah which is changed. wonderful and you just reminded me we didn't talk did we about anti antifungal resistance which we said we were going to talk a little bit about yes yeah and i think um so it, it, antimicrobial resistance one of the microbes i think is fungus yeast and i think we we i'm not sure whether it's actually dentists who have got a problem with um with over prescribing um antifungals for oral candidal infections um, and I've got to be careful because I'll end up saying oral candidosis. And I know that this is the United States and we need to say oral candidiasis, <laughs> which is wrong. But anyway, um, the um, 
the um, and you know we've gone uh, the last twenty odd years have been talking about the do you really need to treat somebody with denture associated erythema to stomatitis um, that you know the the denture the erythema associated with dentures is, is not really one hundred percent caused by candida it's about denture hygiene rather than than more um, that the, there's a so that don't just throw um, azoles it's, and the the go to drug here has always been myconazole. Um, Dactar and oral gel, and and the, there's cross resistance to happening between all of the azoles, um, fluconazole, myconazole, um, and that the, there's now an increasing amount of um, people who have got serious systemic diseases um, that are coming up with candida albicans, which is about eighty percent of the the diseases are caused by, and or eighty percent of the oral infections are caused by candida albicans, and candida albicans, and somewhere around about five percent of them in those patients with systemic infections are resistant to to all of the azoles um and you start thinking well is it because dentists just keep on throwing around myconazole all the time amphotericin b is a better drug and i don't i don't think that's available in america um it, it is here it's not in the uk either used to be but it's not anymore not for dentists ah. yeah that's a that's a pity because it, it, it's a really good and it's it's not really well absorbed um, across the intestine. It's very topical effect if you if you need it. Um, but I think as we're saying, you know, we, we've got to look at anti you know the antibiotic use. We also have to look at antifungal use. I, I do feel that the the people who are the ones who are prescribing um, antifungals the most are actually our pharmacists. Um, you, you know, people go in, they poke their tongue out um, at the pharmacist, and they walk out with a something in the bag, usually dactarin, oh, you must have thrush in the mouth. And they don't. That's probably geographic tongue or hairy tongue or something else, but it's probably not thrush. Um, they don't need the antifungal agents. So I think it would probably lag um, a little bit that the, the, because the um, because of those drugs are actually really effective, but they will slowly increase. And there's some species of candida which are actually inherently resistant to, to the fluconazoles. Um, I just don't have that biochemical thing. So I think we need to, I just keep on popping up and sort of saying, don't prescribe. You don't need to prescribe all the time antifungal agents. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that message is, it keeps going, doesn't it? You don't need to prescribe all the time antifungals, antibiotics, yeah. you know, find, find another way if you can do. So we've got another question here is, um, what, what if someone's on an antibiotic already for something else? You know, do you need to wait until you prescribe an antibiotic? What I would say for that is, why are you thinking about giving them an antibiotic? Because if they need antibiotics, they need to work. If they don't need antibiotics, don't give them an antibiotic. But if they need an antibiotic and they're already on an antibiotic for something else, then that should probably be being referred into a hospital. Because when I say if they need an antibiotic, what I mean is if they've got a, a swelling on their face, their head and neck that's going somewhere, you need to be really sure that that's not going to occlude the airway and stop them breathing or the head on back through the uh, angular vein into the brain to make a brain abscess. So I would say don't be just prescribing them another antibiotic um, if they've been on something recently. You, you know, you need to be thinking carefully about whether a referral is better than a um, than a just a, an empirical prescription of of something that you think might might work for them. We had a, um, a, I've got a colleague over in South Australia who, South Australia is an odd place. I shouldn't say that. There's probably no people from South Australia here, but it is a bit odd. Um, but it's, there's, there's one central hospital for, for a very large state. Um, and he did a study looking at all of the people who were admitted with Ludwig's angina um, and problems with airways from dental infections. And every, and it was about 30 or something over a period of 12 months. And every single one of them had had more than two courses of antibiotics um, uh, before they got admitted. And it was like, and, and sometimes five or six courses of antibiotics, not, not always from dentists, most of them were, were, were from medical practitioners, um, but it's that, just keep giving antibiotics, just, it do, you've got to do the dentistry um, somehow. And if, and if your dentistry doesn't work, then maybe it's not primary dental care that needs to be done. Maybe it needs to be in a yeah, hospital yeah. setting. Talk to our MaxVac surgeons, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so then that lead, leads us on to um, what if a patient has C. diff symptoms? What what should you do? Now, I, I'll take this one for a start because I, I was talking one day doing a double lecture with a pharmacist 
And they said, if someone calls you up and says they've got C. diff, can they come and see you? They've not got C. diff. Because if, they're, if they've got C. diff, anything more than five seconds from a toilet is too far. And they will, they will not be wanting to go anywhere. Um, and if they do have C. diff, you certainly don't want it to come into your surgery either. So if someone is very ill and they have really, really explosive, very severe symptoms, you need to be telling them to stop taking the antibiotics, obviously, but to contact their general practitioner. Yeah, yeah and throw in, throw in liquid water as well. Keep drinking water because they're often they'll get really said not able to do things because they're dehydrated. Um, and then, you know, that dehydration can sort of not see things, not see things rational. They're in a lot of pain um, and they get dehydrated and it's like, oh, no, I'll just lie in bed and they get sicker. Um, yeah. yeah, water. Exactly. And then the very final question is, do we have a protocol for if someone says that they're um, allergic? Should we give them a little bit of an antibiotic and see what happens? That's a really hard one, um, because if they really are allergic, you're taking the risk of, of um, that person having an anaphylactic reaction. Um, so you're um, so no, I don't think you, you should be doing that. Um, somehow you've got to find a place where you can get the patient seen um, and get them challenged in a safe environment um, that they can do that. So it's it's really hard to do that. But well, so we're anticipating that the study we're doing and this we're not alone in doing this study. There are lots of other studies that are done in the past and uh, there's been that systematic analysis um, that have shown that that, that you can de-label people. It's just having the right infrastructure around. And if, if dentists become engaged in that with their patients, we're just going to be another one of the oral health, another one of the health professionals doing that. But the, the facility has to be there that you can, the patients can go to and safely get challenged uh, with the antibiotic. And I'll have to apologise to... Margie Stephens. It is a lovely place, South Australia. She's just put on the thing. South Australia is listening. It's beautiful. The Barossa Valley, the you know, the wineries that are around. Margie, there. Oh, high five. Guy. High five. <laughs> <laughs> I hope to see you at FDI World Dental uh, Congress or whatever it is in um, next year. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Caught out, Michael. <laughs> yep. I thought <laughs> I was safe. At, they do that at Melbourne County Cricket Ground, don't they? <laughs> yes. Um, so I think that's all the questions done um, and you'll be very proud of me tonight because it's actually the World Cup and England has been playing in the World Cup while I've been on this webinar but I've just heard that we've won so we're through to our next round so happy days. So us Australians and Americans congratulate you but we, are we going to follow now now that neither of us are in are we going to you follow, could follow England? England now couldn't you? Yeah well, we could also follow you know Argentina, France, do we have to follow England? You don't have to follow England. You can do whatever you like. You normally do, Michael. <laughs> so, I will. Yeah, no, it's good. Thank you, everybody, so much for your engagement. Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, the listeners. Thank you, ICD, for inviting us. Um, I have a last bit of script here to read out. It says, thanks for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you at the next ICD online event. All attendees will receive one continuing dental education credit which will be emailed within the next 10 days. The recorded version of this webinar will be available later this month at www.icd.org under the Media Centre. To help us continue to improve our webinars, please complete the brief survey that will appear on your screen shortly. See you soon.